good time to get started. Good afternoon, everybody, online on this beautiful Friday afternoon. <clears throat> I know there is a very large number of participants for today's lectures, and there is a great energy, and I want to welcome all the participants, colleagues, and students. We have over 100 people watching online. My name is Stefan Lehmann, and I'm a professor of architecture based in Las Vegas. And the Global Lecture Series, Spring 2021, is a collaboration between the AIA Las Vegas, AIA Nevada, and the UNLV School of Architecture. Thank you to the American Institute of Architects. There are four lectures, and these are always Friday afternoon at 1 p.m. Pacific time, free to all participants, and registration, as you know, is through the AIA Las Vegas chapter website. The lectures are by Snow Hetta, who was our guest in February, Saha Hadid Architects was our guest in March, and today with us is the Renzo Piano Building Workshop. And next week, 23rd of April, we will have Transolar. Uh, if you have not yet registered, please do so soon. I am thrilled that our lecture today is by Renzo Piano Building Workshop and by Daniel Hammerman. As most of you, uh, of you will know very well, <clears throat> RPBW is an incredible global design firm and powerhouse, which has developed its own in-house design process and architectural language. Before I introduce RPBW and our speaker, Daniel Hammerman, I want to briefly mention the theme of the lecture series. The series of presentations explores the question of civic space, infrastructure, and public buildings, and their changing role within cities in the post-pandemic and in the age of climate change. A question I know that occupies architects and urbanists around the world. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Renzo Piano Building Workshop and Daniel Hammerman, RPBW alumnus based in New York City. The firm was established in 1981, exactly 40 years ago by Italian architect Renzo Piano and has offices in Genoa, Italy and Paris, France. RPBW is led by nine partners, including founder and Pritzker Prize laureate Renzo Piano. The practice permanently employs about 100 architects together with the further surgery support staff, including 3D visualization artists, model makers, and administrative staff. Renzo Piano was born in Genoa in 1937 into a family of builders. While studying at the Polytechnic of Milan, he worked in the office of Franco Albini in 1971. He set up Piano and Rogers office in London together with Richard Rogers and with whom he won the competition for the Centre Pompidou Cultural Centre in Paris. He subsequently moved to Paris and from the early 1970s to the 1990s, he worked closely with the engineer Peter Rice, sharing the Atelier Piano and Rice from 1977 to 1981. In 1981, he created Renzo Piano Building Workshop. Renzo Piano has received numerous awards and recognitions there's a long list, including the Royal Gold Medal of the RIBA in London in 1989, the Kyoto Prize in Japan 1990, the Goodwill Ambassador of UNESCO Award 1994, the Premium Imperial in Tokyo 1995, the Pritzker Architecture Prize, of course, in 1998, and the AIA Gold Medal in 2008. In 2013, Renzo Piano was appointed Senator for Life by the Italian President, and in May 2014, he received a Columbia University honorary degree. Similar to Frank Gehry, with 84 years of age, Renzo Piano can't stop. He is personally still very much involved in the daily work and every project. Since its foundation, the firm has been able to design and build an impressive series of amazing architecture on a global scale, attracting a large group of followers. RPBW is an international design firm that works at all scales in all sectors, ranging from master planning to interior architecture, furniture design, lighting design. The office has designed over 500 projects and Renzo Piano says, good work comes from teams where no one accounts for the origin of the idea. So there is a very strong ethos of collaboration. Each of the project is different, unique, and their design is to a large extent based on thoughtful design research. With each one of these projects, there's an enormous effort to combine research investigations with the selection of construction techniques, 
and materials used. And there is always an interplay between simplicity and complexity of detail. RPPW is often mentioned for their high-tech aesthetics together with Norman Foster and Richard Rogers. But I believe there is a difference which we might like to discuss and explore more later. Daniel Hammerman, AIA, worked with Renzo Piano Building Workshop for 12 formative years, first in Italy and then on site in Texas and California, before recently in 2021, establishing his own studio Atelier Tech in New York City, together with co-founder Sergei Drouin. He joined RPEBW in 2008 after completing a BA from Columbia University and the MArch from the University of Pennsylvania and several years of practice at Studio Rinaldi. At RPBW, he was a team leader on the design, development, and execution of the Kimball Art Museum expansion in Fort Worth and the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, two projects I'm sure we're gonna see more about. Daniel followed both projects from the initial design phase in Genoa through to realization in Fort Worth and Los Angeles. He also worked in waterfront mixed use developments in Europe. Daniel is a member of the AIA, the Architecture League of New York, and a member of US Architects Declare, focusing on carbon, biodiversity, and social and environmental justice. He will first give an overall introduction of the specific RPBW philosophy and of his work, and then present selected projects, including the extension of uh, the Kimball Art Museum and the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Daniel's ongoing work with Atelier Tech draws from methods and sensibilities honed while working at RPBW, back and forth processes between hand sketching, physical models, drawings, 3D models, renderings, and performance mock-ups in full scale. We are very honored to have Daniel with us. And I hope you will enjoy the lecture, which will go for 45 to 50 minutes, and then followed by 20 minutes Q&A. All participants are invited to send in their questions via the chat box function. Please use the chat box. Please join me now in welcoming Renzo Piano Building Workshop. We are super happy to have you with us, Daniel. Over to you now. Hi, uh, is this working? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Great. Um, sorry, it makes me a little nervous. I can't actually see anyone and get any reactions. So I'm, I'm happy to make this uh, conversational. If anyone, please do share your questions and in, uh, in the chat and, and Stefan, feel free to interrupt me and uh, guide me back. Um, can, you can see my screen, I hope. If not, let me know. Um, so a... Um, I can't see it yet. Your oh, screen. you can't see it yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, didn't make it very far yet. Hang on a second. Share screen. Now it's coming up. Okay, fantastic. Civics lesson. Um, don't worry, this won't be a dry lesson, but um, I was given a uh, prompt by um, Professor Lamin, uh, which is unusual. So usually, um, you know, when I've given talks before, I like to jump right into the details. Um, my uh, background with RPBW is, um, I, I've been, as Stefan was explaining, I, I've been based in Italy during design phases, and then I've moved to the construction sites where I followed the projects all the way through to the last detail. And so it's really, for me, a lot about the process and, and the details. Um, and today I'm, I'm zooming out a little bit, uh, or I'm trying to uh, stay out of the weeds and kind of look at it holistically. I gather you, there's a, a studio project um, focused on civic buildings. And so I'm thinking a little more about um, the themes and, and um, philosophies and sort of ties that bind between the different projects. And so I had to uh, Google civic um, first to understand what uh, the discussion is about. And, um, you know, when you Google it, the first several pages are uh, the Honda Civic, um, which, uh, you know, at first, seems a little disappointing. You have this noble idea of what civics are and then you see a, a little old car. And, but it did make me think a little bit um, 
what why did they call this car the civic um it, this is the original model it was built in uh you know it, it was invented in 1972 in japan and um you know why did they call it the civic uh what was the idea behind this car and why has it had such staying power and um it uh I guess some of the values they were going for that made it unique at the time uh, and which are still relatively true of this car is that it, it, it's really a city car. That's probably why it's called the Civic. It's compact, it's nimble, it's lightweight, it's economical, it's efficient, fits well in parking spaces. It's not a, it's not a roadster, it's not for long drives. It plays well with its neighbors. Um, it's appropriately scaled and uh, it, it, it so that's why perhaps it's called the Civic. Now, also in 1972, right around then, was the Pompidou Center, uh, which was the kind of breakthrough project for uh, Renzo, uh, along with Richard Rogers. Um, I actually learned that they, because uh, Stefan was asking, I, I learned that they actually met in London while they both had the measles. They were introduced by a, um, a, a mutual doctor that they were using and they hit it off and they each one of them was kind of a you know a thoughtful young architect with not a lot of work and some experimental projects and they decided basically well why not be two young experimental architects with not a lot of work and so they joined forces and they were lured into this um, design competition for the Pompidou Center by um, uh, Ted Happold and Arab uh, team, and they they joined um, the heavyweight engineers while they were relatively young unknowns. And you know there were some seven hundred or something entrants, and they believe it or not, they won. Uh, this project, uh, you know, not only was it formative for the office, but it also on the on the theme of uh, civics uh, is obviously had a strong uh, position on um, civics and what that meant. Now, a lot of people, at the, this was a highly controversial building at the time. You can see the larger context uh, in historic central Paris, La Marais uh, district. You know, uh, there were height limitations, there were material limitations, there was a, a strong texture and history. And this was quite a brash uh, addition to the neighborhood, so to speak. And um, Renzo likes to say they, they were like the young bad boys of architecture at the time. And uh, so a lot of neighbors did not appreciate the sensibilities, but, um, you know, civic does not always mean timid and well-mannered. Um, you know, some th this particular project, well, over there, sorry. Um, so among other interesting things about this building, of course, it, it sort of turned things inside out. You, it's very dynamic. You see what's happening from outside in, inside out. Uh, it really reinvented the museum in some way and that um, it, it kind of took the museum off a pedestal uh, of the neoclassical model where you go up a big flight of stairs and you're in awe of these objects that are in a temple. This is more a public facing, um, institution where uh, it's meant to be more welcoming, more transparent, more dynamic, more flexible. Uh, and um, part of the building is not just, you know, the architecture of the building, but its context and, and the piazza in front that was created or the Parvi uh, here. And, you know, this is an incredibly dynamic, huge open space, which is not that common in the area. Um, and, and that's part of what brings the building to life. It's, it's not the architecture alone, it's the people that animate it. Uh, and this is a bit of a jump backwards, but um, you know, Renzo's uh, uh, Italian from Genoa. This is the um, central Piazza di Ferrari in the center of Genoa. Um, he, you know, he, he draws on his Italian heritage in interesting ways at, at different times. Uh, not to say that uh, it's a historicist view of the world, but there are, it, it shapes his way of thinking um, and the office's way of thinking. And Italy has a, has a rich civic tradition. Uh, it's unique in the, in the I'm not a historian, so I'm probably going to say some wrong things, but the, the history of the, um, 
city states and the strong um, urbanism of uh, Italian um, history and then you know each one had its own language they were rivals but the scale of the um, uh, history is 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 unique and the piazza is they come in all different shapes and sizes they have all different functions um, you know the equivalent in the U.S. There is not the same so in the U.S. you know the English word would be plaza and most people hear plaza and it sounds barren and windswept maybe a little corporate uh, but in Italy it is the opposite it, it is the essence of civic life it's a a vibrant place. It's central. It's flexible. I guess it's not always central. This one is central, but sometimes they're smaller. Sometimes they're in more neighborhood oriented, and sometimes they're larger scale and more civic oriented. Uh, sometimes they have things in the middle, such as this water fountain in the middle of the Piazza di Ferrari, and they are sites where people gather for protests, such as the photo on the right. And then sometimes like here in Siena, um, well, you have, horse, you have your horse race, you have Palio, you have um, all different types. Uh, on the right is Place de Vosges in, in Paris, which is also right near the office um, in Paris and near where Renzo lives there. And this is often a, a, a reference point. Um, so sometimes piazzas are more picturesque, sometimes they're more blank slate, sometimes they're more defined, sometimes less. Um, but just uh, wanted to give a little um, context to one of the civic themes that um, rears its head frequently um, in, in our projects and kind of the toolkit of civic um, engagement, let's say, of the architecture. This is a, a recent project in um, Hangzhou, uh, China. It's a headquarters for um, JNBY, a clothing company, but it also includes galleries. It includes um, all different types of program and it's uh, highly um, active. These photos do not do that justice, but uh, it's very well populated. And the concept of this piazza is, um, you know, an apple that's the opposite, green on the inside and white on the outside. So it has the kind of mineral opacity around the perimeter and the, the green, green space on the inside. Um, this, another um, Genove, Genove, Genovese piazza, this is Piazza della Maddalena, uh, in the historic uh, quarter of Genoa, but it's, you know, a tiny little wedge, which, you know, and on the right, this is um, St. Giles in London project, uh, which also had kind of a carved out smaller piazza in the center. Sometimes the piazzas are inside, not outside. Uh, this is the Fog Art Museum, uh, the Harvard Fog Art Museum in Boston. Uh, where there were some historic buildings and there was some intervention within them and this central courtyard was carved out in the middle of it. Uh, this is the um, California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Similarly, this is semi-inside, semi-outside. It's naturally ventilated and open, but it um, does have shades and lights and so it's, it's sort of a central courtyard and they're used for all different kinds of programming. Going along with the um, civic theme, uh, uh, something that often comes up, uh, especially in the site design phase, let's say, where there's kind of a, a massing strategy and understanding of the context, uh, is always trying to find these, um, first of all, where, does the, where should there be a piazza? presuming that there should be one. What's the organizational logic of the site, trying to find the flows, uh, trying to understand the um, organization of the space so that it's intuitive, so that um, it's transparent, so it's welcoming and people don't get lost in, in corners. Although interestingly, Genoa is a, a, a very, you know, it's a medieval city full of lots of winding alleys that you do get lost in. But I would say with, um, the, most of Renzo's projects, the ethos is not that. It is more uh, to find a, a intuitive wayfinding so that you don't need signs, so that you see where you're going, so that there, there are central axes. Uh, so on, on the left is the typical um, you know, Roman model of the Cardo, uh, the Decumanus, north, south, east, west, primary axes, and the forum is located at the intersection of the two. That's the origin of the piazza. On the right is the um, master plan for the uh, Columbia University um, 
Manhattanville campus, which my um, partner Serge actually uh, worked on. And so in this project, this is 125th, this is Broadway, this is uh, the West Side, the Riverside, um, trying to find those axes, um, both on the larger scale than on the smaller scale, and find here's the bigger piazza, here's the smaller piazza, and trying to when creating, in this case, a, a little new village, trying to find that logic uh, of organization of the site. Um, and this was the phase one. So these were the first three buildings that uh, my colleague Serge uh, worked on and developed. Uh, and, and so some other interesting civics lessons from, from this project. Uh, part of the goal of, of the university and of the project was to um, foster this um, foster dialogue and innovation between um, different uh, people who might not otherwise bump into each other. So it was intentionally juxtaposing diverse fields here where you have, you know, uh, mind, brain and behavior, um, science labs, you have an art center, performing arts, visual arts, you have a community center, a forum, an auditorium. Then you also have a lot of um, community oriented outward facing uh, functionality, especially on the ground floor. Uh, Columbia actually learned a bad civics lesson back in the 60s, which I don't have a slide for, but they tried to extend the campus into Morningside Park. Uh, on the east side of the campus back in the 60s, they were planning to build a gym there, uh, but that sort of eminent domain of the of uh, or attempted of the um, public park there did not go over well. There were huge protests, uh, and it, it had bad optics. It was not only taking public land, but it had it, even though it was going to be shared with the community, it had it because of the grade drop off. It had a high level entrance for the university students and a low level entrance for the um, community. It just had terrible optics. There were terrible protests, and it died. Uh, so the campus remained constrained to its original McKim, Mead, and White um, earlier in the century campus until um, our PPW got involved with this expansion um, 10 blocks north uh, a bunch of years later. So having learned their lesson, they were um, keen on uh, improving their civic spirit. And the, the whole idea of this campus was to be more outward facing, more connected. I mean, that's why uh, Renzo Piano Building Workshop was the right architect for the job, that this kind of civic ethos, transparency, connectivity, uh, weaving through the streets. Um, <laughs> one thing that's interesting I've noticed over a while is there's some graphic techniques here that are meant to represent the civic dynamism that is to be fostered by the projects. You, you can see um, this yellow coloration uh, in the public areas, in, in the streets, in the piazza, in the lobbies, that's meant to represent a concentration of energy. Uh, you have also this kind of spiral. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. Oh, okay, I'm on the wrong screen. Um, uh, th this kind of spiraling of, of intensity of energy in the center, this finding of the axes in each direction, th and this yellow coloration here in these areas is meant to, to um, represent the uh, intensity of energy and exchange that happens on, the, on these projects. And also within the scale of any individual building, finding those north, south, east, west, those primary um, axes. Um, in this case, there was a bit of a metaphor for the science labs. And, and related to that, the notion of um, lifting the buildings off the ground um, and creating what, what was called on, on this project, the urban layer. So literally floating the buildings above the ground plane and allowing for this connectivity um, through the ground uh, from the outside to the inside such that you aren't imposing this massive object on the ground plane that kind of blocks views and, and connectivity. Um, so this is like a section all the way through from Broadway to the west side through this entire new campus along 125th Street. Uh, similar downtown, uh, the new Whitney Museum, which actually did work on for a couple days before switching projects. Uh, 
honestly, maybe it was not my favorite project of the office at the time, but uh, there are very interesting urban strategies here. Similar, like literally this, you can see how the building um, pulls back off the street and opens and, and um, the continuity from the sidewalk to underneath is a restaurant under here and the lobby and the shop are back there. Um, and the, the vibrant, uh, you know, seeing that the, the pulling the circulation out of the building. So you see it when you're in the neighborhood, you engage with the context while you're there, you aren't in a hermetically sealed box. Um, another version of that, the, the Santander uh, in Spain, the um, uh, art center also elevated off the ground, perhaps owing a little bit to the um, pilotes and the, the um, you know, the five points, uh, but on a more urban and civic, uh, not, not just a formal uh, gesture, but there's actually a, a civic programmatic element here. And then also another important civic cue is kind of um, borrowing from and, and relating to the existing context, which is not to say copying, but understanding the scale, the materiality, the um, composition of the context. And this is another kind of um, cross section through the whole campus and trying to find that DNA uh, of the site, the exposed structure, the relationship um, to it, and, and the kind of the, the brash exposed steel framing that for the overpasses of the subway and the roadway, and kind of using that language in the architecture. Um, this is the ground floor space of the Forum building, which was, yeah, it's called the Forum, like the Roman, um, like the classic Roman uh, gathering space, which is actually the function of this is the triangular building to the south, which is really a community center and meant for gathering. And you can see the um, at street level, you're, you know, there's no drop off. It's completely transparent, always low iron glass, uh, you know, high visibility in both directions from outside in, inside out. Uh, there's sort of a heightened urbanity when, when the context is framed uh, and an engagement of the site. So even though you're in the building, you're, you're still in the city. Uh, and that's true upstairs as well, um, that, you know, you, you, see the, uh, you see the trains passing by. And even within interior spaces, you see people in the other spaces. It's always this um, emphasis on transparency and openness. Even, you know, drawing the lines of where you see to, oh, I keep highlighting the wrong screen. When you're when you're in the um, uh, when you're in the building, where do you see to? And and literally drawing those sight lines. Um, and then um, another uh, kind of um, reference image on on transparency: the Menil Collection uh, in Houston, which was the first. Um, well, I mean, I think it was the first project in the U.S. and and another kind of milestone project following the Pompidou. Um, and uh, the um, central courtyard within the uh, gallery spaces. This is a, uh, uh, so I'm not just gonna, you know, I'm not a Renzo Piano Building Workshop scholar. I'm not a scholar of any kind. Uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about my own, the own two projects that I worked on. Uh, this one's from the, um, so this model, kind of like the image before, uh, this is for the Kimball Art Museum, uh, looking towards the lobby. Uh, and you know, mo most people might look at this and it's not the most exciting image in some way. It's, uh, you know, it's some plexiglass with some scored lines to represent the mullions, it's two walls. Uh, but for us, this is an important uh, image and, and step in the design process. And it's to give you a sense of scale. So a, a couple of things you'd see here, First of all, there's lots of people. Second of all, there's many layers of glass you see all the way through. The people are to scale, everything is to scale and where the photo is taken is from eye level of what one of these model people would be at. Uh, these people, we actually um, have a special place in Paris where we cut, these are all laser cut, it's called coupe chimique, uh, that, where they laser cut thin sheets of people with these little, uh, pointy things sticking out of their feet and you stick them into the foam core base and it gives you immediately a, a sense of scale and, and vibrancy that's uh, critical to 
project. Uh, we do make a lot of physical models with um, that are always to scale with um, and always with people in them. So the, the Kimball Museum, uh, I would bet most people are familiar with uh, at least the Louis Kahn uh, original project um, from 1972, which is, um, or, or uh, sorry, I think it was, yeah, right around the same time as the Pompidou, which is amazing. It's almost a, a polar opposite. Uh, um, Louis Kahn is a different type of architect, although Renzo actually did briefly work for him. Uh, it's, Louis Kahn is a bit more professorial, a bit more abstract, perhaps a little fancier dressed, at least in this photo. Um, and his approach is more uh, architect as artist. Uh, whereas Renzo is more architect as builder. Um, and uh, I think, which is not to say that they were not, they didn't have some level of, uh, obviously Renzo did work for him and appreciated some things. He, he would say, um, when I was working on the Kimball, he would say the two things he learned from, uh, from uh, Louis Kahn were stubbornness and magic. Uh, and those are two things that I think uh, do permeate the works of both architects in very different ways. Um, Louis Kahn, uh, a lot more um, internally focused, uh, sometimes preconceived forms and geometries, but always, you know, inventive, embrace of natural light, um, uh, and always finding magic. So, of course, this is the original um, uh, Kimball Art Museum. You know, is this a civic building? Well, certainly it's a public function, um, but in what ways is it civic? And how do they, you know, I would say it's a bit different in its approach to uh, context and, and to civics than is the building that uh, we did next to it. Um, yeah. Again, ethereal, natural light, um, that you are aware of your context when you're in this building. It's not that it, you're completely walled off, but it is a temple. It's, it's a temple or even a mausoleum, but, it, it, but you do see uh, the natural light. There are the courtyards within, there's the light filtered through the sl slot on the roof, um, but it's, it's inward focused. Uh, much more so. It's more uh, embracing of mass and, and concrete and stone, in some ways more Roman than um, Renzo, who is Italian. And it, it, it inspires awe, right? It's, it's, a, it, it's massive. The, um, so when we uh, got involved with the Kimball, um, there was certainly a, a reverence for the context and a thought about what's the appropriate um, way to handle this. You know, uh, it's, it's a very challenging commission and uh, it had to be done exactly right. And there were a lot of um, iterations early in the design of how to be a good neighbor and what's the right thing to do here to not Im Im impinge on the original. And, and so this is one of, one of the many very early schemes and, and looking at the modularity of the uh, con vaults. And originally the site was going to be um, over here where these gray ones are, which it was the um, Darnell parking lot. Oh, uh, because it, this was a sacred public lawn, uh, the South Lawn, and you would come out from the con building and you would see the, the trees and nature and that was it. And the Kimball owns this parking lot here. And so the first schemes we did were to use this site, which was, you know, a safe distance. And we did work on it. Uh, and after a while, um, people came to the realization that uh, it was too respectful, or let's say it was important to have a dialogue with the original building. Uh, and so it did move, we, the project moved onto the site. This was another early study when we first got onto that site, uh, quite different than where we ended up, but the, 
you can see even from the beginning, even when the massing and, and geometry is completely different, there was always trying to draw on that, um, on, on kind of, kind of continuing the um, lines of the envelope across the site. Uh, eventually it settled um, on the scheme and it's still, you can see this, uh, you can see this critical dimension over here. We walk back and forth across that line, across that lawn so many times to measure exactly what's the right distance. You had to be close enough to have a conversation, um, but not too close, but not too far away so that you'd have to yell. It was just kind of just the right distance that the scale was appropriate. And uh, behind the double row, the LA of trees, the, um, and there, there was also a, a um, riff on the structural module, the, the scale of it, of course, could not be any taller than it. For sure, you want it to be just the right height, um, you know, and the, and the right height on the outside versus the right height on the inside. There was uh, some play there. The structural module, actually, the proportions of it were halved. So in, in this axis, in, in looking at the south elevations of the two buildings, we, instead of going with the 20 foot, we cut it down to 10, but in the other axis, uh, it goes the full, um, the same long span. So it, it also has the same kind of tripartite logic where you have this central bay on both, uh, which is the lobby, uh, and then you have galleries flanking on either side. Uh, as part of the kind of site design and civic strategy here, the idea was even though we were now on the same site as the building, we still wanted to maintain as much of the lawn open as possible as a, it is a, a civic gathering space. And a lot of the program is buried. Um, the auditorium, uh, there's another gallery, education facilities, library, conservation facilities. A lot of stuff happens under the lawn here and under this building here. So it's just a one story pavilion in the middle of the park was, was the basic concept. And there was a, an attempt to kind of find the grain through the site, finding the north, south, the east, west, even in a car centric culture here. Um, it was uh, trying to find that urbanity and trying to create those spaces that are, are nice for gathering. Uh, that was a, a mistake of the con building um, that we attempted to correct in this project that, um, you know, this was always meant to be the front entrance to the building and people were to go on this wonderful procession through the gravel, the crunching underfoot past the fountains up the um, uh, generous uh, stairs and in through this um, grove uh, uh, into the front of the lobby. But in reality, Everybody parks back here and enters through what was the back door, really, of the museum, not the intended sequence. And so as part of this new project, when we had to do additional new parking, it's actually underground here. And what happens is you, you drive in through a tunnel down here, you go in here, and you pop up in the middle of the lawn, oriented, to, there's a glass elevator, and the door is open, and you look towards the con building. Uh, so it reorients you towards where Khan always wanted you to enter from. Uh, site plan, maybe it's even clearer to see that kind of organizational logic of the plan, uh, the tripartite division, the long span, and the flow of people. Uh, there were um, a lot of discussions about that public space between the two buildings and what was the right way to, um, to design it. Uh, and in the end, it was the lightest touch possible, really. Uh, it, it's completely open and green. There's just some small, uh, uh, you know, pavers uh, running between the two buildings, just the right with the path, just enough for two people to go side by side. At various points, there were discussions of other things, water features, piazza, like a hardscape piazza. But in the end, it was decided that the appropriate thing here was to leave it as a green piazza. So it's a um, completely open space. And again, that kind of discussion about the, the conversation between the two buildings kind of borrowing some things about it, the scale, the proportion, but not necessarily the materials. Yes, it's concrete, but it's rendered differently. Um, 
and and yes it's there's natural light flowing in through the top but it's more of a mechanical approach where you can tune the amount of light um and here another view of the um of the elevation if you were from the con building looking towards the piano pavilion uh some interesting things to see in this um Drawing again, drawn from eye level as you would experience it if you were there. Always the people are in the foreground, always the trees. Uh, the building is almost, um, you know, receding into the background. Uh, you know, it's it, <laughs> drawing the trees, drawing the people. That was one of the, you know, first civics lessons you get working in the office. There is no manual when you start working uh, that this is how we do things here or anything like that. Uh, you just kind of uh, absorb it and you see how things are done. Uh, and again, this is it's all about the respect for the context and and not screaming for attention. Uh, you know what brings buildings to life is not the architecture for us. It's the it's the people. It's the vibrancy of the program. And it's the engagement of the context. Even, so even when you're in the galleries in this building, there's always a um, attempt to reconnect you with the outside, um, what we call the winter garden to see out from in. The lobby with the layers of glazing, just like in the model photo, um, circulation through the space, uh, always framing back towards the con building that you can see through. I have to pick up the pace a little. The auditorium, uh, and then the Academy Museum in Los Angeles was I, after finishing up the Kimball in Texas. I moved back to uh, Italy to work on the design of this project. Uh, and again, interestingly, a historical context that we were uh, intervening within. Uh, perhaps not as revered as the Khan building. However, it was a landmark uh, on the exterior, it was a landmark structure. Uh, and again, trying to, um, this is the wider campus plan. This is the LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art buildings over here. And over here, this is where the new Zumter building uh, is under construction currently. This is the La Brea tar pits all the way out here. Trying to find this um, kind of axial, orientation and, and connectivity across the campus was a, an important part of the master plan. Uh, Renzo actually, the office was hired to do the, you know, we did the original, uh, these buildings about 15 years earlier, the Broad Contemporary Art Museum and the Resnick Pavilion, both within LACMA, this piazza here. Uh, and we, we kind of created this master plan to emphasize the, the linearity, urbanity, and connectivity across the campus. Another car-centric place, um, but this it, this kind of super block here really is a bit of an oasis in the city. And um, uh, I think we were trying to kind of create a, you know, this is a pedestrianized campus. You don't drive within it. Uh, and trying to, and the weather is so wonderful, you, you kind of want uh, to encourage this outdoor circulation between the uh, between the different buildings. In fact, with the um, new campus, uh, with, with the Academy Museum, so here is the, in this corner is the May Company department store, uh, which was a gut renovation. And then this is the Sphere building that was added to the north, which includes the theater and a terrace. Um, this building was built in 39, but was actually extended two bays in 46. It kind of went out here, here, and then stepped back like this. But uh, that bit of additional, those additional two bays cut off this axis that had been carefully created. And so as part of the renovation of this project, um, we actually trimmed back to the original 1939 envelope. Uh, to allow for the continuity of that um, access all the way out to Fairfax, which is a major, this is Wilshire, this is uh, Fairfax Avenue. And back again a minute for the, the Piazza um, theme, uh, Piazza San Marco in Venice, uh, high tide um, at night. And uh, we, we liked to think about this project a little bit. Uh, yes, there is a context, but we, we thought of the, the um, museum uh, theater. This is the thousand seat theater as, as almost like a trans, 
supportive device like a movie itself that you would watch inside that it takes you away from your uh, surroundings and uh, that it's something that could be like a spaceship and take off and land anywhere and why not in um, Piazza San Marco and but just because it's a spaceship doesn't mean it should be completely scaleless and and not relate to its context and um, so we actually did some dimensional drawings and we looked at um, when we plopped it back on our site here is the the May Company building and um, Um, uh, we, th so it may look uh, a bit um, uh, otherworldly, but it, that there is actually quite a bit of it that relates to the scale of the existing. The, the bridges that connect between the two buildings dictate the floor levels, both the entry to the theater, the terrace level here, um, and the kind of grain of the, you can't really read it well in this drawing, but the uh, the, the module of the um, structural grid from the original building and the stone cladding on it also um, kind of informed the uh, uh, the treatment of the uh, new building um, as also the LACMA um, sawtooth roof beyond, which also had this strong uh, east-west um, four-foot grid. And um, with the, with the, you know, discussion about the connectivity, the back and forth between the buildings, inside the outside plan and section is just as important, if not more so than, than plan. And kind of um, the vibrancy of seeing people circulate between all these spaces is part of what uh, makes them uh, uh, wonderful civic spaces. This is, this is the historic building. It actually does not very well illustrate the purpose right now because the, the windows were all, um, uh, I'll have brown paper masking on them during construction, but uh, as part of the project, um, all of these display windows um, from the historic department store are completely opened up uh, and glazed and the floors are dropped to the floor so that uh, you do have, uh, skipping ahead a little bit, um, you do see in, you do see inside from out and outside from in, and they're not just for displaying objects, they're for displaying activity and displaying light. Um, uh, this is inside the center of the May Company department store. And you can see it was certainly not precious uh, on the inside. Uh, we stripped out years of plaster and vinyl and uh, all kinds of applied uh, finishes and got back to this original uh, texture, which is a board formed concrete encasement of a steel frame building. And it was um, treated as kind of like a, a dream factory, a, uh, a building where we got down to the guts of it. We, under, we learned from the module of it and we worked with it um, as an intervention, uh, but trying to bring in as much light to the, from the outside, as much connectivity as possible, making it a more dynamic space where you circulate between floors. Daylight does not work very well in a film uh, galleries, but it works great for circulation and that helped kind of inform the, the um, layout of the building where uh, the north, so the, this north facade here uh, that's all fully glazed, that was a non-landmarked facade. It was the street, streetscape, uh, street facing facades, the other three that were Landmarked. This is where they had bumped out two bays and we trimmed back. So when we trimmed back, we put in glazing to maximize the daylight and this whole area, all the slabs were opened up to allow for this dynamic circulation, escalators, elevators, views between floors. And this kind of um, Renzo calls like a Japanese shadow where you, you're kind of um, with such uh, bright backlighting, you see the the strong silhouettes of people as they move through the building, and th this kind of embrace of uh, circulation and and activity uh, is part of what makes these projects urban and engaging with their context. That yeah, things are kind of on display. This is another. This is the Gardner Museum in uh, in Boston. This Pompidou, of course, um, and then back to the Academy with. You know, the, the bridges connecting the different buildings. When you get into the sphere, this is the, the reason why the, the sphere is a separate building is doing a large span uh, 
thousand seat theater just does not work well in an existing structure with all the limitations there, but really almost all the rest of the program is in the historic building. So this is the um, Geffen Theater, uh, theater in the round, thousand seats, one rake. Uh, this is the other, the smaller um, screening room theater, uh, the Sims Man uh, Theater in the um, basement underneath. Uh, and the piazza on this project, um, you know, it, it's part of the campus and we tried to continue the ground plane materials. We tried to avoid any grade differences where you would have steps or anything that would be, not be 100% accessible. Um, you see, we this building itself is lifted and you can see all the way through from Wilshire to 6th Street, um, from through the old building, through the pedestrian street, under the new building. Um, and the, the precast itself is a, a very a whole other story, but a very uh, wonderful luminous uh, material. It, it has a sheen to it when the, during the day. You appreciate being in the shade in California as you would in Vegas, but uh, you do get a uh, good daylight under here because of the rake uh, of the underside, we call the belly, and the luminous um, uh, color and, and sheen on the panels. The volume of the of the building, of the sphere is completely shaped to the program uh, within, as well as to be generous to the space underneath. So this rake corresponds to the seating rake of the theater above. Uh, these cuts on the side allow for you know more light to come in. You don't want to feel like you're under oppressive concrete close to your head. You know, millions of tons. Um, and this building is 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 levitating like the spaceship on these base isolators uh, to accommodate seismic movement. And interestingly, it's also even tied down, like tethered to the earth with these um, uh, basically shock absorbers. Uh, these are um, uh, base isolators are designed for up to 30 inches of movement. But once you kind of um, reach the maximum there in theory, these tie downs will pull the building back to earth. Uh, even the illumination, the in-ground lights here um, uh, kind of highlight the um, uh, levitating nature of the, of the project. And a little bit like the um, Piazza San Marco, uh, these little points of light all along the stairs, the exposed circulation uh, is, is all about bringing it to life. I mean, maybe a little more industrial aesthetic, a little bit oil refinery, as much as Piazza San Marco, or maybe um, somewhere in between. And then, you know, you're circulating back and forth between the old and the new, uh, and um, going through gallery to gallery, uh, and gallery to theater, and, and event space to terrace. And then as you get to the top, uh, your final view is again, looking back outward at the city. And uh, this is the terrace space on top of the theater, and you look out at um, at the uh, Hollywood Hills, which is where all the, the films that are projected within were made. So that's your that's what the reason for being of this uh, of this institution in this place. Uh, and your you know the location is very important, and you're connected back to your to your context. So I think I wanted to. I think I've covered everything I've got, uh, Stefan. So I'd be happy to, I didn't have any uh, wonderful conclusion, but I'm happy to take any thoughts or questions from you or from anyone out there. Thanks, Daniel, this was fantastic. Uh, it's so interesting because with both projects uh, in Los Angeles, uh, Motion Pictures Academy, and of course the extension to the Kimball, you have to deal with an existing, historically existing significant building, and you still wanna clearly be contemporary and show your own language and not imitate, and, but also extract them. You said, you spoke about the contextualism where the lines are brought through on the site, they mean something, and also the connectivity of pedestrians. Uh, thank you for explaining also the yellow in the drawings. I was always wondering why. <laughs> the energy, of course, yeah. So very well done. Uh, I got a couple of uh, questions here um, that uh, I can, uh, if, if, if you're okay, thank you for uh, speaking um, so detailed. And what one question is asking, 
about the detail language of Renzo Piano Building Workshop, which you, you haven't addressed yet so too much, which would be great to add. Um, and then there, there is this interplay between simplicity and complexity in the detail, you know, the prefabrication, the modularity, uh, going back to the spirit of the 70s. And I, I mentioned earlier, Renzo Piano is often mentioned together with Norman Foster and Richard Rogers as high-tech aesthetic, but I think his humanistic approach and dealing with the heritage and all that is very different from what Norman and what Richard Rogers are doing. So I believe there is a difference uh, which would probably be uh, interesting to, to hear more your thoughts about. Uh, where do you see um, Renzo moving away from that strict 1970s high-tech aesthetic that Richard Rogers, for instance, uh, is very much uh, driving in his uh, work? Sure. Well, I mean, as much as I'm not an expert on, on Renzo Piano Building Workshop, I'm even less an expert on, on his colleagues. Uh, they, they certainly share some, uh, some themes and interests and, uh, and there's commonalities in their approaches, uh, celebration of, of detail and, and construction and um, maximizing materials. Uh, I mean, I think Foster in particular has, I think, diverged the most in some way, uh, and and at least uh, I don't know if that's I don't know. I, I I tend to a lot of Foster projects tend to be a little more slick or a little more chic in some way. Um, not to say that's a bad thing or anything, but more minimalist. And I think that. Um, in Renzo's work, um, we try to kind of um, celebrate the detail and expose it uh, to an even greater degree. Uh, this um, image here, the, the dome. So, I mean, usually I, I talk almost exclusively about details and construction and um, uh, the, the nature of design. I think that's where a lot of the, our projects kind of uh, sing. And, and distinguish themselves because oftentimes it's not necessarily the geometry or the, the you know the shape or the form of the building that's super exciting like okay it's a rectangle it's a circle it's whatever it is uh, where where it um, uh, where it becomes special is is to do with the the details and the material so in the case of this sphere. Um, here, and yeah, I didn't put any detailed photos in the, in the deck, but um, there is that careful balance between simplicity and detail. So uh, certain, that one overriding thing, you know, we, we of course we, we uh, work on, on sketches, full scale models of, of components and uh, an overriding thing here was the four inch diameter um, uh, primary member running always east, west. Uh, and that had to yeah, that established the hierarchy. So you didn't want you always wanted the structure to be primary. You didn't want all the conduits and sprinkler pipes and uh, north south elements that were not on the um, rigid um, orthogonal grid. Things that were following meridians. You didn't want any of those to overwhelm the the primary, you know, uh, grain of the project. So a lot of um, detail and coordination goes into everything about these projects yeah, and the shades them you know the, the finding that grain uh is helpful that finding that that grid uh is what um it's it's like a, a compass when you're developing the project uh in terms of uh, every system that you develop for the project the roller shades the lighting the conduit the piping the concrete slab everything about it follows one after the other. I don't know if I really answered your question, but... Um... No, no, very good, very interesting that even the meaning and the direction and the intensity and rhythm of the detailing has a higher urban logic, which is interesting. Uh, that's why you feel always um, there is a clarity 
uh, in Renzo's projects, you never get lost, you know? <laughs> uh, not like, let's say, Daniel Libeskind's projects, which try to confuse you <laughs> uh, and make you dizzy and maybe uh, make you getting lost. So a very interesting. Uh, there are a couple of other questions that came in, uh, two uh, interesting ones I want to um, follow up. One by Joseph Branca. Joseph writes, uh, I have been a fan since my college days in the 80s. Thank you for this. To touch on a hot current topic, how has Renzo Piano advanced or pursued sustainability in any way? Can you can you maybe talk about the importance of sustainability uh, for all, for all projects? Sure. Um, that's meant to be a, a double entendre, a hot topic because the planet is warming up. Um, it's I wouldn't call it. Uh, a newly hot topic for us in the sense that uh, since the early days, that has been a, a theme. I mean, all the projects uh, are, you know, target extremely high performance uh, uh, criteria for the development. So uh, on this project on the screen, um, there was a lead gold, I think, um, you know, sustainability is always thought about holistically uh, on our projects. Uh, it's not like a checklist, although, of course, I just mentioned the lead. But uh, you think about, for, number one, what's the most sustainable is making a great building, making it the right building for the site, building just the right amount, building it efficiently, and doing it exactly correctly, addressing the program. I mean, that goes without saying because that's what makes a building last. And the idea is when you make the building, you do it right and it's there for hundreds of years. You can make it, you know, out of uh, whatever and it's perfectly checks all the boxes. But if it only lasts 20 years or less, that's not sustainable at all. So the first thing is is an exhaustive understanding of the of the program and the needs and building the right building. That's on a maybe more abstract level. Then when it comes to the actual um, technologies and, and design strategies, um, you know, almost every project embraces daylighting and, and natural light, which is both, uh, you know, doesn't come from an engineering perspective. Uh, it comes from a humanistic perspective of, of wanting to uh, be connected to nature and, and the you know, wonderful um, qualities of light and, and color rendering. But of course, you know, the more daylight, the less electric illumination, you know, the more you embrace your, the, the context, the less you have to fight it. So that comes with lighting, it comes with ventilation. I mean, a lot of the spaces on this project are naturally ventilated, not uh, mechanical, such as this terrace, for example. It, as uh, besides the big openings on the two sides, there's operable flaps uh, up at the top. There's uh, the, the concept is that even though it's actually <laughs> working a little bit at cross purposes here because the high level of transparency could you know create a condition where you would be like an ant under a magnifying glass in the space. But um, there are some clever uh, elements here that um, mitigate that and that the general uh, uh, approach to the design here uh, is to that comfort conditions in the space should be similar to being outside under an umbrella. And so there's roller shades which are retracted in the current in, in this photo. Um, but uh, they actually track the sun. There's a sensor that follows the sun over the course of the day to block the direct sun. There's an interstitial space between the shades and the glass, uh, which uh, along with the vents up at the top, creates a, uh, or accelerates what would otherwise anyway happen, which is the stratification of the air in the, a tall space like this, um, so that you create kind of a uh, stack effect and, and whisk the air out. Similarly, in the escalator atrium uh, that I was showing in the, in the old building, um, there's air that gets moved from the galleries, which are class A conditioning for, you know, high performance for the artwork, but then it circulates through the you know transient spaces where the circulation spaces where the requirements are lower and so you get a second use out of the air and then you exhaust it through the fans at the top of the atrium i don't know there, i could talk about sustainability for a long time uh each project has its own unique strategies uh that are kind of integrated into the design from 
from the beginning. It's not something you go to an engineer late and say, let's make this sustainable. It's just, it's kind of part of your thinking, uh, how you orient the building. Uh, those kind of early key decisions are the majority of the um, impact. Very interesting. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. There's a comment also from John Johansson that this is very much in the ethos of Buckminster Fuller, uh, who of course, was uh, interdisciplinary hybrid, you know, being an architect, engineer, inventor, and many things, and uh, with a very strong humanistic reference first. So I think that's a very good comment. Another question that came in, which is a longer one, is about the disappearing of the public client. I mean, you guys are lucky you're working still for public clients, you know, and do, you do museums and libraries and concert halls and theaters all over the world, but, uh, what, what is happening is that's an exception now, that's very unusual, uh, as you will know. Uh, and the comment is that for 5,000 years, architecture has been a public profession, a profession that works for the public interest. And that's why we discussed the civic, uh, the social mission of the public as client, for instance, the cornerstone of modernism, you know, when you look at modernism and the modernistic ideas of uh, providing good housing for the masses and all that, uh, there was always the public was the client. And this largely disappeared in the period of neoliberalism and the free market economy. And in the face of reduced public budgets, more and more responsibility is pushed, is transferred from the public to the private sector. So it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts about that as somebody who's still building so much for the public because we are in the process of losing an architecture of good intentions that was not in question during the 20th century. Um, for instance, 40 years ago, um, it was normal to have a public client. And Ren Kohlhaas argues, as you will know, uh, with the loss of the public client, much of the architect's work lost its authenticity and the position of public architecture and urbanism has been compromised with a disconnection from the public sector and increasingly intense relationship with the private sector, which has led to dissatisfaction everywhere concerning the outcomes of large urban developments, public space and buildings. So that's to quote Rem Kolhas. So what are your thoughts about that? A lot to unpack there. Um, I think, uh, number one, absolutely, it's a privilege to work on public projects and civic projects. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, when I was in school, this was the dream. Uh, I'm sure it is for uh, other people listening. I mean, it, it's wonderful to be able to give back to the public and, you know, to be impactful in that way. Uh, are there fewer public commissions now than there used to be? Perhaps is the ambition of, of um, public institutions to build large scale and big scale thinking less than it used to be? Quite possibly. Uh, but uh, everybody has an impact on the nature of cities. And it's, a, you know, it's not that public clients are necessarily always the best clients. Uh, and it's a cop-out, I think, to say, you're working on a public building, it must be great, or you're working on a private building and everyone is a money-grubbing you know, person trying to make it as efficient as possible. Whatever project you're working on, whatever scale, uh, there's always an oppor there, there's always opportunities for uh, making your work um, civic minded, uh, and you could be doing a developer. You know, it's I, I've worked on two museums. I, I did also work on a, a mixed use development for about a year, uh, and and we've done uh, plenty of projects with developers and commercial oriented projects and that doesn't make them less urban or less civic and it's just different kinds of opportunities and every client presents their own challenges uh, you might find in some cases private um, patrons are even better clients than public ones uh, there might be a single point of decision making uh, and if they're sympathetic to your ambitions or they have their own strong ambitions, it's a lot clearer than when you're dealing with public institutions or boards or larger um, uh, uh, institutions. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> the, civic, uh, the civic nature of things, uh, one thing I've heard Renzo say once or twice, um, you know, 
when it, when it comes to architecture and its role, you know, if, if you make a bad movie, you can turn it off. If you make a bad painting, you can take it off the wall. If you make a bad building, <clears throat> everybody has still has to live with it. Everybody has to walk by it. Everybody has to engage with it. Um, so there is, along with civics, comes a, a sense of duty and responsibility to get things right. Uh, and it doesn't matter who your client is. Uh, it, it, it needs to be done well for the sake of everyone. Yeah, you cannot avoid a bad building. <laughs> it's right in your face, <laughs> the public realm. Um, there is one last question, uh, which is interesting because you showed a couple of projects where you always lifted the buildings off the ground. Uh, and you say not to impose the massive object on the side, to block the view. You elevate the building off the ground and you put it up on pilotes or somehow you do some, uh, uh, some structural acrobatics to have the building up in the air. And this has become, especially if you see the new building in Athens and other projects that have been realized recently, that has become one of the radical, more radical moves of Renzo Piano's architecture. Now that would require, uh, because of its additional costs and all that, <laughs> it wouldn't be easy. You have to get them people up. You have to, you know, how do you get people up? Escalators and so on. Um, you, you have to spend much more money on that and you have to do a lot of convincing. Can you talk a little bit more about just that pure idea? I mean, obviously it goes back to Corbusier, you showed uh, Villa Sava, but I think there's more to that. Uh, you know, lifting the buildings off the ground and have them floating. Uh, a lot of people have tried it uh, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work so much depending on how you do it, obviously. But uh, can you talk more about the background and the thinking behind not occupying the ground? You know, it's almost a political manifesto here. <laughs> can, any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it, it is a... Uh, manifesto of sorts uh, a lot of times it is giving the ideas to give space back to the public and and that the you know in some sense that no one owns the ground you own the building you make the building but the ground you know the idea of property rights that's a whole other discussion but uh, I think there are um, it comes out differently on different projects and it's not, I, I did happen to show a couple um, slides of, of buildings that are literally elevated like that on PLOTs. It's not to say that every building is like that, but it is a, um, a design approach that often um, has resonance on in particular urban projects. I mean, the, the Kimball um, Museum is not floating at all. Um, the roof kind of is kind of thought of as like a magic carpet that does cantilever a bit and, and it flies a little bit, but the building itself is firmly rooted in the ground. And that's partly in, you know, in response to the site and in to the con building. There is a game between the lightness and the mass, the, the um, levitas and the gravitas, the concrete and the glass. It's not all glazed and transparent and floating. There, there's kind of a, a, a dramatic balance between the two. This project, the Academy, is the most dramatic that I can think of in terms of this concept of the floating building. And yes, it did come with cost, um, but it, uh, yes, and it came with cost. Uh, the, the, structure, the way this project works um, structurally, it's basically a big shell structure. Uh, and um, so there was shoring underneath it while you poured the deck and it had to be there for a while um, until the full shell was formed. Uh, but it's maybe not as complex as you might, well, it was complex, but it may be not as difficult or as you might think that the um, reason that the sides are all precast concrete as opposed to cast in place is because that way they could all be um, prefabbed. You get the precise geometry, you get the quality finish. Uh, and they were actually used as formwork for the shotcrete, which was done in place. So there was actually no, um, for all the spherical walls, there was no formwork on site. So you didn't have to have double curved plywood that you were relying on people on site, which is a very painstaking, expensive, long process. Here you erected the panels and you shot out of a gun the, the shotcrete against them. So they were structural precast. Um, 
guess I'm getting a bit off topic. I, I think that, um, so on this project, it's literally floating and it spans across the piazza and there's just the base isolators at the two sides. So that's the most extreme example I know of. On most, pro on most projects like Santander or Whitney um, that I showed earlier, uh, and, and the Columbia buildings also don't float. It's just that there's an emphasis on the transparency of the ground plane. And so it, it gives the sense that the building is floating, even though it really isn't. With the Columbia master plan, actually, where we had the opportunity to even develop the guidelines for the for the campus of which, you know, we did the first few buildings, but going forward, other architects are doing other projects, including I think Diller and Scafidio is doing one now, there'll be others. We actually were able to set guidelines, for example, mandating transparency 30 feet into the building, so not allowing for mass along the sidewalk and opacity. Uh, and there's no structural gymnastics there. It's just uh, uh, an ethos that informs how you lay out program and, and opacity versus porosity of the envelope. The Whitney and the um, uh, uh, Santander that I was mentioning, those are... Um, elevated, uh, but also there's not really anything special about them structurally or expensive per se. There is program on the ground floor, it's just glazed in. So the columns are exposed and the, you have the sense of the mass or the hull of the ship, or as it were, is just out, you know, the first deck that's solid is one floor up and the, all the, you know, articulation of the facades and the lighting and everything kind of emphasizes that. But structurally, they're just, you know, slabs and columns just like any other building. Yeah, the selection of the glass becomes very important. You can't have too much reflection, otherwise you lose that transparency. Um, there is a question from Herman Kaleja. Do you consider demountability in your detailing? So assembly and disassembly, both for potential maintenance and potentially for future reuse? Interesting question. Uh, Honestly, not really, um, mainly because uh, we like to think that our buildings are not going to be disassembled. We like to design them thinking they're going to be there for, we, we, we joke, but we say this is a 500 year building. Is that real? I don't know. I think the parts that they'll certainly have to recalk the glazing at some point, uh, you know, but we design these, you know, it's, it, it is a privilege again, working with, you know, a solid institution. It's not going anywhere. It's not a speculative development that's going to, it could be adapted for a different use. Uh, so all that said, that's not like a driving factor that we think about when we're designing, but we do like to expose all the details and we like bolts and we like exposed connections. You understand how things are put together, how they were made, how they uh, work. And so the truth is if someone did want to disassemble this, I would hate to see it after all the work, but uh, they could do it uh, pretty easily. A lot of exposed connections and um, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, in terms of like recyclability, it's it's not that we use a lot of um, composite materials. We tend to use steel over aluminum. Uh, you know, if someone wanted to dismantle this and uh, and upcycle the parts, they could do it. It comes back to durability. Uh, you know, like the old Italian towns that have been there for 800 years. Uh, that is, of course, extremely sustainable. And the flexibility, you can adapt it to different use uh, because your grid, your span, your structural system, your floor to floor height allows for that. Very good. Okay, so I think we, we discussed a lot of interesting things. It's 2.20. Uh, and I know there was a, a, a big interest. We still have 80 people online. Um, some dropped off in the last five minutes. They probably have to go to other meetings. So thank you again very much, Daniel, for right. your generosity of your time and to speak so openly uh, and, and to take us through all those projects and make the effort to look holistically uh, in terms of through the lens of civic public space, um, which, which is great. Uh, so uh, big thank you from Las Vegas and from the AIA and uh, the School of Architecture. And I wish everybody who's listening uh, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, all the best, and I hope to see you next week for Transolar. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.